So uh, yesterday we, we spent a little bit of time talking about the working with real estate agents brochure. This is one of the videos that the Real Estate Commission has available for consumers. Uh, but it does give a, a nice overview of kind of all of the aspects that we've talked about. So I thought I'd just take a minute to... Are you considering buying a home or other real estate? If so, you may also be considering hiring a real estate agent to assist you with the purchase of your new property. Real estate agents can provide many useful services and work with you in different ways. When buying real estate, you have several choices as to how you want a real estate firm and its agents to work with you. For example, you may want them to represent only you as a buyer's agent, or you may be willing for them to represent both you and the seller at the same time as a dual agent. You might even prefer to be unrepresented and work with a seller's agent or sub-agent. Some brokers will offer you a choice of these services, others may not. Whether you choose to work with a buyer's agent, dual agent, or seller's agent, that agent must treat you honestly and fairly and disclose all material facts that the agent knows or should know that could influence your decisions in the transaction. The North Carolina Real Estate Commission has developed a brochure titled Working with Real Estate Agents to help you better understand what a real estate agent's duties are, what services your agent will provide for you, and how the agent will be paid. The Real Estate Commission requires every real estate agent to review this brochure with you and to ask you to sign it before collecting any confidential information from you or assisting with your purchase. Signing the Working with Real Estate Agents brochure in no way obligates you to work with the agent who has presented it to you. Rather, your signature acknowledges that you have received the brochure and that it was explained to you. If you choose to have a buyer's agent represent you, that agent owes you certain duties. First, the firm and its agents must seek to promote your best interests ahead of all others. They must be loyal to you, follow your lawful instructions, and provide you with material facts and information associated with the property that could influence your purchasing decisions. Your agent must also use reasonable skill, care, and diligence throughout the process and account for all monies handled on your behalf. Once you have agreed orally or in writing for a firm or agent to represent you, they may not give certain confidential information about you to the seller's or seller's agents without your permission, like your motivation for buying or your negotiating strategy. For this reason, avoid telling the agent anything that you would not want a seller to know until you enter into an agreement to hire an agent. A buyer's agent will perform a number of services for you, such as helping you find a suitable property, gather more information about a property you're interested in, <coughs> prepare and submit an offer, order inspections, and prepare for closing. A buyer's agent may be compensated in different ways. Often the agent will seek compensation from the seller or listing firm first, but require you to pay if the seller and listing firm refuse. You and the agent will address the company's compensation arrangement in the written buyer agency agreement. Be sure to read and understand any agency agreement before you sign it and make sure it includes any promises that the agent has made to you, as this is your only contract with the agency. You will also be asked on the buyer agency agreement if the firm you are hiring will be allowed to participate in dual agency. Dual agency is when the firm that represents you represents the seller at the same time. This is most likely to happen if someone in your agent's firm is working with the seller of the property that you've decided you want to purchase. Understand that in a dual agency situation, the firm and the agents owe identical obligations to you and the seller rather than being obligated to only represent your interests. Because of this, your agent may lose his or her ability to advise, counsel, or advocate for either you or the seller. Some firms may offer a type of dual agency called designated dual agency. This is where one agent within the firm is appointed to represent only you, and another agent within the firm is appointed to represent only the seller. Neither agent should have confidential information about the other party at the time of designation. This type of dual agency restores your agent's ability to advise, negotiate, and advocate for you. For more information about the duties and responsibilities of real estate agents, visit the North Carolina Real Estate Commission's website at ncrec.gov. You can find many Q&A brochures, including the Working with Real Estate Agents brochure under the Publications tab.
going to use this video if you're a real estate <coughs> broker working with buyers. I'm going to use this video. What? You can show it to him. You could show it to him. Sit down at a table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Show it to him. Well, they're on the fence about a decision or being hesitant. Okay. Yeah. Maybe before you actually meet with them to start showing properties, you could uh, include a link with this video so that they have a chance to view it beforehand. Gives a nice overview of what buyer's agents do and what buyer's agency involves. So you might be able to use that. There's also one for the seller side as well. And so again, um, you know, it might be a, a, a good way to um, kind of break the ice with somebody, to give them some idea. Make sure that they're fully informed. So just an idea there. Um, so let's see. With that in mind, um, I thought we'd have a little fun with, with working with real estate agents brochure. Did everybody pick up this handout when you walked in? There's, a, there's one next to the sign-in sheet. Some of you are here at 3 o'clock this afternoon, so they missed it. <laughs> Okay. All right, so before we get started, I want you to take a minute and I want you to read through this. All of the directions that are on it. Has everybody got one now? <laughs> Maybe not. She didn't go to my real estate school.
of smiling while you're reading this. You were taking it way too <laughs> seriously. So um, we've already found a few, uh, few uh, theatrical stars in our midst, but let's see if we have any others. Would somebody be willing to be our provisional broker PB? So come on up here. Well, you didn't say that. Here. Come on. <laughs> yeah, never volunteered. Sorry. Now the rest of you are directors. Okay, and you know what the director does when he sees something that he doesn't like, or she doesn't like, they say, "Cut!" Right? Oh yeah. And so, so when uh, when they uh, when you feel like you need to stop the action. Um, say cut loud enough so we can all hear above them, <laughs> and and tell us what you think. What what's going on there that you don't like? Maybe we need to change what they're doing a little bit, uh, or what more more um, accurately what the broker is doing. We'll give the we'll give the buyer a break that they're doing what they're supposed to do. So, I'll set the scene. DB is a provisional broker at XYZ, part of the All-Star Realty team, acting as a seller sub-agent while holding an open house for a top producer in the firm. PB is eager to do everything correctly, especially the review of, the, of, the every, of everything by the book. The scene begins with a knock on the door. PB is ready and waiting with business cards in pocket, property flyers, and working with real estate agent brochures in hand. PB answers the door and ushers the buyer into the foyer. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to my open house. Before you go any further, I need to make sure you know that I am working for the seller. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, cut. Sorry. <laughs> A wee bit eager. Maybe starting with uh, I'm working for my, my, my open house. My open house. Yeah, oh, that's me too. All right, let's continue on. Okay. I'm not the listing agent. I'm a sub sub agent for the seller. Did I hear cut? Yeah, I, I mean she's going into way too much, in my opinion, detail too soon to someone who's really just. Yeah. Yeah. Sub-agent of the seller, what the heck is that, right? I don't even know what that is. Well, that means, <laughs> that means that I'm, that means that anything you say to me about this house, I will have to tell the seller. So, make sure you don't say anything bad about the house that you don't want me to, to tell the seller tonight. By the way, are you currently being represented by an agent? Oh, in that case, I need to give you uh, to look over this working with real estate agents brochure. Uh, I mean, really, here she, you know, you told us yesterday we were talking about you, you really need to, when you're presenting that, it's more from a uh, perspective of caring about them. You know, I just need to make you aware. She's like way in there. <laughs> the brochure, and, and I'm editing. Mean, we haven't had significant. Have right. We have not had the. Well, on top of that, there's no welcome to it. Like, you're not going to be willingly walking in this house feeling like you're there for the right reason. Right now, you're still in the foyer. Yeah, still right here at the entrance. Right now, you're a great one. He hasn't even seen the house yet. He hasn't made it past the. He's always said two words, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, let's, uh, let's keep going. Listen, mm -hmm. I'm just looking. Uh, listen, ma'am, I'm just looking. I'm not interested in buying a home yet. 
that's okay. The law says that you can come to an open house, then you need to have the brochure explained to you, and you'll have to sign it. Really? Hold it. <laughs> what do you think? Is that true? No. No? It's not true. no? Mm -hmm. So it certainly doesn't have anything to do with coming to an open house, does it? What does it have to do? When does the brochure have to be explained? First substantial contact. First substantial contact. Have we hit that point yet? No. no. Uh, okay. Really? Because I've been to a lot of open houses and no one has ever said that to me before. That's so disappointing. I know that agent having an open house down the street, he's a real slacker. <laughs> At least I'm doing it wrong. Yeah, <laughs> What was wrong with that? He's a real slacker. Must be slamming other agents. You can't be slamming <laughs> other agents. That's just wrong. Yeah. No, we don't want to be doing that. PB pulls out the brochure and shows it to the buyer, opens it, and points to the part about sellers. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Here are the ways a person who is selling property can work with a real estate agent. But I'm not selling at home. Right. We'll come back to that later. A broker can work exclusively with, a, exclusively with a buyer. That way, all of the buyer's confidentiality information is protected. It's dual agency. If the broker has a house listed that the buyer wants to look at, then the broker can't help the buyer anymore because it would be a conflict of interest. We're all taking all it. Keep going. Yeah, it's not all that sounds like a bad deal. No, no. It's okay because the buyer and seller have already been told that the agent is now a dual agent. So that makes it okay. Okay. The good news is that I don't have any listing right now. So you don't have to worry about me being a dual agent. Also, my company practices designated dual agency. So even if I had a listing, it wouldn't be a problem. Not, no, uh, no listings, you're just starting out, you don't have any listings, you can't be a dual agent, right? No? Why is that wrong? So, you can't have a listing with your provisional broker, is that not right? The really no, no, you can't have a listing. You have a buyer, though, that's interested the in the house. Broker, the but are they really firm. broker in charges? Right, but, but if you are a broker in a firm, and they have buyers and they have sellers, you are by definition a dual agent. Because uh, if that if those buyers and sellers are looking, I mean we're talking about the same house, then even if you're not working with that buyer or that seller, you're part of the team. So you're working for that buyer and you're working for the seller. Even if you're not directly working with either one. Right? Because Every broker in the firm is working with every client in the firm, theoretically, right? When they hire Alan Tate, they hire every agent in our firm. So yeah, you could be a you could be a dual agent, even if you don't have even if you don't have a listing. And especially if you're working with buyers that want to look at listings that are listed by the same company. All right, keep going. What's designated dual agency? I'm so glad you asked. Designated talk. Dual agency means that the buyer and seller are each represented by agents from the same company. The company can designate those agents to work exclusively for their specific clients. So, for instance, I could represent you as a buyer's agent. The listing agent is not on my team, so there would be no conflict of interest. Shaking her head back there. What do you think? Okay. She said the listing agent's not on my team. Mm -hmm. Don't have to be on the same team, do they? Mm -hmm. Right? So any listing in the firm, if he's looking at it, it would be a dual agency situation. But designated agency, we could designate her to be his buyer's agent, right? Mm -hmm. And the listing agent could be the, the agent, regardless of whether they're on the same team or not. But uh, don't you have confidential information about the seller? You're holding an open house. Yeah, that's the great part. I've got all the scoop on the seller. Well, that's 
Interesting. Thank you so much. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, we're not done with the brochure. Mm -hmm. We could just work together under an oral agreement as long as you will work only with me. We could just do it for a week or two. <laughs> What's wrong with that? What do you say? What's wrong with that? I mean, why would it only be for a week or two? What? No, the oral agreement. No, it was oral agreement. Oh, the so, oral agreement. Oral yeah. agreement allows you to said work. Long yeah. work only with me. Oral agreement can't be for a specific period of time, can it? Right. Or can it be exclusive, right? So you can't say you'll only work with me or you or work with me for a specific time. All right. I don't really need to go. Well, will you at least sign the brochure? It's required by the real estate commissions that I get a signature from everyone who attends an open house. I'm not signing anything. I just came to see the house. Oh, please sign it. I could lose my license if you don't. It's not a contract. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. It's like a stoker. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, actually, you would you can, you can present it to your spouses or significant others. All right. So, you know, obviously that was tongue in cheek, a little bit of fun. But it does uh, point out some things that you need to be aware of. You need to think through what those rules are about designated uh, dual agency. And, and really, uh, when do I start talking about? Um, dual agency and, and or agency in itself. What, at what point do we need to start covering that? And so it's not as black and white as it may seem. Because people come in and they want to talk about stuff, and it's it's very tempting uh, as a broker to want to make casual conversation that starts to get more personal. So you guys are out uh, making the open house rounds. Yeah, yeah, we you know we. We really are, are thinking about um, you know buying a house sometime in the near future. Oh, okay, that's great. Uh, so, um, wh why did you decide to come to this one? Well, we really need a four-bedroom house. See how that goes? I mean, pretty soon you're crossing over that line. And I'll be honest with you, most brokers don't you know jump out with that brochure as soon as somebody crosses that line. Kind of have to use your your judgment about it, but again, try to establish some kind of rapport with somebody before you start asking them to sign something. It's probably a good idea. Um, uh, you can't blame them for for not wanting to you know go on a first date before you even you know, get to know each other. A little bit. So um, so that's. That's something to think about <clears throat> with our working with real estate. Thank you again to our actors and actresses. Good job. So um, let's just kind of quickly review a few of these terms and things. Uh, when I talk about agency, what uh, magic words am I looking for? Uh, what is agency? Fiduciary relationship. A fiduciary relationship between a client and a firm, firm okay, or an agent and the principal, right? Something like that. How's an agency relationship created? How do we? A contract, yeah. An agency contract of some kind and. Who's involved in an agency contract? Agent, right? Plus the principal. And the agent is usually who? The firm. And the principal oftentimes is seller, buyer, seller, landlord. And then, uh, who's involved in an in-house brokerage employment contract? Okay. The agent in this case is who? Who's the agent in an in-house brokerage employment contract? 
the broker. Right. So I am the agent of my firm. Make sense? In a sales transaction, what's the relationship of the individual broker to the buyer or seller? It's a fiduciary relationship, but what what kind of uh, what kind of uh, relationship is it? Sub agent to the principal, right? <clears throat> so the individual broker is a sub agent to the principal. The firm is an agent to the principal, right? Kind of hammering this whole thing. Examples of agency contracts, listing and buyer contracts, of course, dual agency, property management contracts, and the in house brokerage employment contract. All of those are agency <coughs> contracts. What type of agency contract is not in writing and is to be avoided? Why? Right. I think we went through this the other day, so. So we talked about the do not call rules and the fact that uh, you're good for 18 months or so if you've had business contact with somebody. Um, and the, the important thing there is to stay in contact with your old clients. Make sure that you, know, you continue to have permission uh, to, to talk with them. Um, if you're doing things right, you should have numerous contract contacts with your past clients so that they know you're thinking about it. Because you know what, well, something like 80% of buyers and sellers say that they would work with the last agent that they have, but only about 20% do. And that's because they forget who it was. Even if they did a good job, they forget who it was. And they're like, yeah, what was that? No, I think they were with Adam Tate. I don't know. Like, you know, if you just kept up with them, if you just sent them a Christmas card, a calendar, if you just called them up and said, hey, how's the, how's the new house doing? You've been in there a whole year already. I can't believe it's gone by so fast. And your kids, how are they doing? Um, we talk about Ford, F O R D. Family, how's the family? What's going on? Your wife just got a new job, I heard. Saw that on Facebook. No occupation. Uh, so when we last talked, you were you were just starting a new thing at your work. Uh, our recreation. Um, I know you really love scuba diving. Have you done any scuba diving trips lately? And and D dreams. You were talking about starting up a new business. Did you ever start that new business yet? Or you know, whatever. So fording people is one way that you keep in touch. Just the, and it's, it can be, you know, it's not forced, it's genuine. You really want to know. So um, if you can't uh, call them if they're on the do not call list, what about text messages? Can we send text messages to people that are on the do not call list? Let's see a few, few people shaking their heads. The fact is that the same rules, if they're on the do not call list, they're, they're, you're not allowed to text them on those phones either, at those phone numbers. Um, I don't know very many people that get new business by texting random people. Um, seems like a strange way to get, get business. So you do see for sale by owner signs. Everybody driving around, maybe you'll see a sign in the yard that says for sale by owner with a phone number on it. Can you call them? I mean, they got the phone number right there in front of the house. Yes. What if they're on the do not call list? Can you call them? Yes. If you have a buyer, would you do it? Ah, because you're, you're not trying to get them, you're trying to gain like a mutual, like a mutual relationship pretty much. You're trying to get in contact with them. What kind of relationship? Well, I had one call me. I did for sale by owner, and they wanted to list my house. Yeah. 
Is that okay for them to call you if you're on the do not call list? Yeah. They they the so, uh, so the fact is, um, you cannot call them if they're on the do not call list if you're trying to list their house. Because they're not trying to list their house. They're trying to sell their house. You can call them, as you said, if you have a buyer. Now, I will tell you that there are agents that will call and say, well, I might have a buyer for you. Really? Yeah. Well, bring them over. Well, you know, I really can't tell whether it's the house for them unless I see it. You know, so this is like a ploy to get in the door and convince them to list with them. But you have to have a buyer, you know, a legitimate buyer in order to call them on the phone. Um, so uh, what if they've called you and left a message? Can you call them back? Yes. Yes, of course. Um, how about an expired listing before the listing expires? Definitely not. Remember we talked about stealing other people's business. So a lot of times, I'd say more than half of the time, people continue to list their property with their old broker. So you know, it's been on the market for six months. Uh, maybe the seller just didn't want to lower the price, but they really liked their listing agent, they just, they just haven't sold it yet, haven't found the right person. That's what they'll tell you anyway. So, um, so if you try to call them a week before it expires um, and say, you know, maybe you, ought to, maybe you ought to list your house with me, you can get in a lot of trouble. So um, what if they come to you and say, my broker's not doing a very good job of listing my house? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned before, you can certainly list a house right before it expires and you put the expiration date right in the listing agreement, but you can't start marketing that property until it's actually expired. But you definitely don't want to be seen soliciting business from somebody else's listing. So going around saying bad things because that broker down the street's a slacker. Not a good plan. So after it's expired, that's perfectly fine. In fact, you can't see the, what the expiration date is in the MLS. So if it's not my listing, I can't look up somebody, other, somebody else's listing and see that it expires in two weeks. But you can tell. You know, if the, if the listing is, you know, five months old, you can kind of assume that it's about a six month listing probably, right? Um, sometimes, sometimes people do a shorter listing, three months maybe, but, um, but you still don't need to be poaching other people's listings. What happens when it expires? When it expires, you can, you can uh, call them if they're not on the do not call list. Uh, but you can always knock on the door. Hey, I'm Wayne Young. I noticed that your house is no longer in the MLS. Um, that, did you know that it had expired? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, it doesn't even show up as an active listing anymore. Oh, well, that's not good. No, well, did, you know, just in case that you're thinking about changing real estate companies, just want you to know that I work in this neighborhood and I'll be glad to help you. Now, I have to admit, I don't really feel that comfortable doing expired listings. I mean, it's just not me. Um, but lots of agents, you know, they, they do really well because what do you know about an expired listing? What do you know about that seller? They want to sell their, business. They want to sell their house, right? That's a whole lot easier than trying to find somebody that might want to sell their house. This is definitely somebody that wants to sell their house. And so, you know, if it expires, then it's, you know, it's good. Some people work for sale by owners. But again, you can't call them if they're on the do not call list, but you can certainly knock on their door. You can send them stuff by mail, right? So which forms of communication are regulated? Um, telephone, 
we talk about facts? Let's see, I feel like I missed that. Oh, here it is. Yeah, so you're not supposed to send facts. It's either unsolicited advertisements by facts or banned without prior invitation. Again, I don't know anybody that hires a real estate broker because they got a fax. But if you do uh, send faxes, be sure that you have an opt out so they know they can stop getting them. And email, um, th nobody ever gets any spam emails, do they? <laughs> Believe it or not, it's against the it's against the law. The Controlling the Assault of Non-Solicited Pornography and Marketing Act. Now, I don't know about you, but I do not want to have that in the paper. Wayne Young was convicted of <laughs> the Controlling the Assault of Non-Solicited Pornography and Marketing Act. Because all my friends would be like, which part of that applies here? <laughs> so, yeah, we're not, but you know, these days, we do a lot of marketing by email, I mean, a lot. Uh, whenever we have, a, we have a past client, we send them up with market reports that come out every month. Do any of you ever get those from agents or maybe postcards or uh, market reports that come in the mail? Um, so Alan Tate has all kinds of cool automatic drip campaigns if somebody inquires about a house, you can set them up so that every couple of weeks they get something. But you'd have to be careful that you're not spamming them. I have had people say, Wayne, all this stuff is too much. Not, I don't need all of that. So telephone, fax, email, these are all regulated by law. Make sure you're paying attention to those laws. What's not regulated? Mail. Mail. Door knock. And face to face, right? Yeah. You can meet them at the grocery store. I always wear, oh, I'm wearing the wrong name tag now. I had a ribbon cutting for the Chamber of Commerce this afternoon, so I had my chamber name tag on. But I always wear my real estate name tag. Uh, everywhere, and you'd be surprised how many conversations I have standing in the grocery line. Oh, you're a real estate broker? Yeah. How's the market? They always ask that. And you know what the answer always is? Unbelievable. Whether it's bad or good, you can say, Un oh, it's unbelievable. And we talk about, you know, well, what, what part of the market are we talking about, right? Because there are parts of the market that are really strong right now. If you have a $150,000, $200,000 house that's in really good shape, I can sell it in a heartbeat. If you have a $700,000 house, it might take a little more time because we don't have as many $700,000 house buyers out there. In fact, there's hardly any $100,000 houses out there right now, too, because so many have got sucked up by investors. So it's hard to find anything in the lower tier, uh, or even the medium tier. So let's talk about rural fees. You know, there are brokers out there that they make a living without ever showing a house and without ever listing a house. They just have a website, um, NorthCarolinaHomes.com, or something like that. People go on their website and they say, hey, I saw this house on uh, North Elm Street and I'd like to see it. And they say, well, I would be glad to show that to you, but I don't work in that area. Let me hook you up with a realtor. And they send a message to some North Carolina realtor and get paid a referral fee. Maybe 30, 35% of the commission goes to Florida. And they didn't do a thing except give them this buyer. You could call it a scam, but this is capitalism. So um, if you have a, a North Carolina broker, um, 
that wants to share some of their commission with an out-of-state broker, the, the most important thing is that that out-of-state broker can't come to North Carolina and do brokerage business. So they have to stay out of North Carolina, as far as actually doing real estate business. Um, so how do we find out if they have a, a real estate license? We can go to this Arello.com, A-R-E-L-L-O, and find out if they actually have a real estate license. Let's see if Japan Secor is in there somewhere. Huh. If she's not, I'm going to be so embarrassed. Oh, there she is. She's a member of the National Association of Realtors, and the North Carolina Real Estate Commission says she does have a real estate license. So yeah, so if you're dealing with somebody that um, is out of state and they want to collect a commission, you might want to check to make sure that they're actually licensed somewhere and they're not just Joe Blow. Can somebody who is not a real estate broker collect commission for selling real estate? Nope. So they can, they can do business in North Carolina through that commission, but they they can't do any real estate work in North Carolina. And it's paid from one firm to the other. You can't pay the broker directly. So if you ever go to a, a conference with a bunch of brokers um, and somebody whispers something about commission, you'll see this hush go through the conference, everybody's like, talking about commission. I can't do that because the um, antitrust laws say that one firm can't discuss commissions with another firm because that would be collusion. We hear that term a lot these days, but um, we don't want people colluding or working together to set the rates. So, uh, nor can the um, Real Estate Commission set those commission rates or the Real Estate Association. There's no going rate for commission. Now, if you ask people out there in the world, uh, how much is it going to cost me to list my house, they probably tell you about 6%, right? But that doesn't mean that that's the going rate because depending on the size of your house and, and uh, lots of other factors, um, if we're talking about land versus that or commercial property, all those kinds of things can make a difference in what the commission rates are. And if you choose and your company allows it, you could list, you could list a house for 2%, you could list it for 1%. Might be a little hard to get other brokers to show your house. If all you're getting is 1%, I'm gonna share half of my commission with you. So that price fixing, setting commissions or fees or commission splits can't work from you know, one company working with other companies to set those. Can't decide, well okay, we're all gonna we're all gonna boycott that particular home inspector. Nobody's gonna use him because he's he's not very good. Can't do that either. Now within a firm, certainly a firm can make rules about what their commission is going to be. And in fact, it's the best thing if you're if you're out there trying to get a listing and somebody says, "Well, will you cut your commission?" Will you cut your commission? Well, the easiest thing to say is, "This is what Alan Tate charges for this price home." Right? What I say is, "Well, you know, I could, but you have to get my wife's permission. She hardly ever gives it. And that usually breaks the ice a little bit. But, you know, the other thing is, if, if I'm listing my house with you, and I can't even negotiate my own fee, how much confidence are you going to have that I can negotiate a $200,000 house with a buyer and a buyer's agent? I don't have much have much uh, confidence in that. So, yeah, I mean, you need to be strong about that. So, um, 
allocating markets. We can't uh, say, okay, Yost and Little, Berkshire Hathaway, Home Services, Real Estate, whatever that really long name is. You get uh, Irving Park and Alan Tate, you get all the rest of all, all the rest of Greensboro. How's that? And uh, you know, as long as they stay in their territory, we'll be good. Um, can't do that. There's no allocating of markets or customers. Um, and this is pretty serious stuff. The Sherman Antitrust Act uh, has a some bite to it. A million dollar fine for corporations. $100,000 fine and three years in prison for this kind of activity. So it's just as well if you avoid all that. So just be careful what you say. We charge, you know, you're not going to say we charge a standard rate or everyone charges 5% for a listing this size. Um, but my company charges, or I charge, so much for this price range. That's perfectly fine. So in order to collect commission, what does a listing broker have to do? If I'm going to close, close, close on the house, sell it. Well, that's one way to collect the commission, but it's not the only way, right? Um, but first of all, we got to be actively licensed, got to be employed by the real estate firm, and be the procuring cause. Okay, procuring cause. Uh, so, a procuring cause is someone that has actually um, been helpful in putting this this whole thing together, right? Um, and produce a ready, willing, and able buyer. Um, <clears throat> so this procuring cause thing is kind of a new term. An agent is due a commission if the sale is not consummated because of an unjustified default. So you uh, find a ready, willing, and able buyer uh, for the seller, and they decide they're not going to sell the house. That would be an unjustified default, and you would still be entitled to that commission. Look on page 191 in your textbook. 191 has a little list there. So the seller has changed their mind, refuses to sell, has a spouse who refused to sign the deed, has a title with uncorrected defects, commits fraud with respect to the transaction or is unable to deliver possession within a reasonable time, insists on terms not in the listing agreement, or has a mutual agreement with the buyer to cancel the transaction. Can you imagine? The buyer and the seller get together and have a beer and they say, how about this? How about if we cancel the transaction, wait until it expires, and then we'll sell it. Then I'll sell it to you for 6% less. Yeah. We'll talk about how we avoid that situation. And what is reasonable time? What's that? What is reasonable time? What is that? What's a reasonable time? Well, in the, in the um, standard contract, um, there is a two week window. So either party, if they delay for two weeks, after that period of time, the non-delaying party can terminate the contract. So officially, over two weeks would be too long. Now that doesn't mean they have to terminate the contract. But sometimes, you know, things get delayed, the mortgage company has to go back and redo something or the appraisal didn't come in uh, enough and they have to renegotiate something. So as long as everybody's working in good faith, usually we'll extend the contract a little bit or do whatever we need to do. But if, if somebody's just dragging their feet, you know, they hadn't even ordered the appraisal yet and 
we got a week before closing. Then, so now it's you know two and a half weeks later, and we still have an order of the appraisal. Um, we're beyond that two weeks. The seller could say, "Look, you're not even trying. I'm going to go sell it to somebody else." <clears throat> um, so, <clears throat> in the case of this, if the seller is delaying, the seller says. Yeah, I'm just not ready to sell it yet. But we got the buyer all lined up, they got the mortgage lined up, and it's you know been two weeks and the buyer terminates the contract. The seller's agent, the listing agent, may be owed a commission. Because they, they did what they were supposed to do, right? And the seller delayed beyond a reasonable time. <coughs> all right, we're gonna take a little break now.